Oh, I should probably get that. I'm going to read a little bit from uh, Revolutionary Suicide as I, as I talk. Um, so. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you for being here, and I want to thank the conference organizers uh, for inviting me to speak. And I'm, and I'm really honored to be a part of this conversation on the great Huey P. Newton um, and his revolutionary legacy. Um, Huey was a man of immense courage, conviction, and brilliance, and I'm grateful to be studying his work together today with you all and with so many brilliant thinkers and interlocutors and practitioners of his work um, who we've heard in the previous, uh, <clears throat> the previous panels. Um, so um, our panel, this panel is about the role of political education, the struggle against this treacherous system, and what it means to create knowledge that is in service of the people rather than profit, which is the modus operandi of institutions of higher learning, like Temple University, where we are today and where the Black Panthers gathered in September of 1970 for the Revolutionary People's Convention to demand, quote, freedom of the oppressed poor by the fascist government, unquote. By now we should all see through the liberal white media's propaganda about fascism as something that originated in November of last year. <laughs> when we look at when we look at the Panthers and Huey, uh, what the Panthers and Huey Newton were fighting against, it is clear that what white people are now suddenly up in arms about, so-called fascism, is the culmination of a 400-year process rooted in European colonialism and the enslavement of black people. This is how Europe underdeveloped Africa, Asia, and the Americas. And Africa and Asia, as we know from Du Bois's The World in Africa, which we're reading at the Saturday Free School, and of which I'm a very proud member, um, you know, this is the story uh, of how Europe underdeveloped Africa, and this is a, this is a book as well, um, but um, Africa, the civilizations of Africa and Asia were far more advanced than Europe prior to the 15th and 14th centuries when we begin to see the, uh, the uh, initial stages of uh, what we have today, which is, you know, f uh, the late stage of imperialism. Um, so this is how Europe underdeveloped Africa, Asia, and the Americas, and why poverty can continue to maintain its grip on black people and the people of the third world. It is myths such as these that a revolutionary education must dispel, an education that prepares the masses to wage a prolonged struggle, an education that raises the, con the consciousness of the people such that they can no longer ignore the contradictions of this imperialist and white supremacist system. Huey Newton said, quote, that the main purpose of the vanguard group should be to raise the consciousness of the masses through educational programs and other activities. If the party does not make the people aware of the tools and methods of liberation, there will be no means by which the people can mobilize, unquote. It is becoming increasingly clear to the students of all major institutions of secondary and post-secondary learning in America that the school system is designed to preserve the integrity of white people and to divide and conquer black people. The curriculum of white neoliberal institutions like Temple begins with the project of salvaging Europe, of which America was initially a colonial extension. It both encourages and rationalizes the, system, the systematic attack on Africans uh, and African-American civilization. Academia, as the conference organizers point out in the, in the uh, panel description, um, serves as an extension of state power. However, I would also say that academia not only interferes with the revolutionary process, it is always already preparing itself to defeat it. In fact, in the past 40 years, as we know, the state has devoted immense resources towards repressing and killing anyone who has dared to fight for black liberation, including our beloved Huey P. Newton, who we are here to um, uh, remember today. Um, 
Huey Newton, James Baldwin, W.E.B. Du Bois, Martin Luther King Jr., Bunchy Carter, Fred Hampton, and so many others who gave their lives so that we can be here today all believed that black liberation is a necessary prequel to the complete liberation of humanity in the movement of history. It is for this reason that I say that white academia is poised to defeat revolutionary thought. In fact, it is organized around this very principle. This is the position that Huey Newton started from in, in, in his 1967 essay, uh, which we're reading on this panel, um, on the correct handling of a revolution. He said, quote, that if we learned by the power structure that black people have, if it, if it is learned by the power structure that black people have X number of guns in their possession, that information, that information will not stimulate the power structure to prepare itself with guns. We must be under no such illusions. The power structure is already prepared. As such, the function of an education that is committed to the liberation of the dark nations, and the dark nations is a concept that Du Bois puts forward um, in, in, his, in his thinking, uh, which encapsulates the unity, the political unity of uh, uh, Pan-Africa Pan and Pan-Asia against Europe and, and uh, white America. Um, uh, so the function of ed an education that's committed to the liberation of dark nations, the function of the revolutionary education and an education for liberation is to teach by words and actions the correct strategic methods of prolonged resistance. Those are uh, Huey Newton's words. Uh, this is also the function of the, of the revolutionary leadership. So in order to understand academia, I think we have to begin with the position that these so-called institutions of higher learning are really think tanks for the ruling class. To put it bluntly, many of the professors who teach at the schools that dominate this uh, dominate the city, you know, including Temple, but not limited to Temple. We have Penn, we have Drexel, we have, you know, a any major institution. Um, these are the, the many of these so-called professors of the humanities and the sciences are the architects of the blueprints for the bombs that reign over Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and right here in African America. The function of the revolutionary education and education for liberation is to teach by words and actions the correct methods of prolonged resistance. Temple University, for example, is a hub for military science. The University of Pennsylvania is home to the Wharton School of Business, which has wreaked, reached, wreaked havoc on uh, millions of people all over the world, working and poor people all over the world. In the past decade in the United States, black people have lost their jobs, their homes, and face routine violence at the hands of the police, the prison system, the medical system as we heard, and all aspects of the white supremacist state, which includes the education system. We must begin with the premise that knowledge produced in such spaces is knowledge that is against the people from its point of inception. As such, we as people must find new ways of practicing knowledge if we are to strive towards a true education, one that is rooted first and foremost in a revolutionary love for the people. I was reading Revolutionary Suicide in, in preparation for our, our study and I came across, excuse me, this chapter. And this entire book is so beautiful, but this chapter especially, I wanted to just read uh, the first section because it, it is so tied to this question that I think we're asking on this panel about education for liberation and, and Huey Newton's experience of the school system. I thought we could uh, read closely. So this is chapter two and it's titled Losing. And it begins with a quote from uh, Kenneth Clark's book, Dark Ghetto. Uh, so I'm gonna just read. Um, the clash of cultures in the classroom is essentially a class war, a socioeconomic and racial warfare being waged on the battleground of our schools with middle class aspiring teachers provided with a powerful arsenal of half truths prejudices and rationalizations arrayed against hopelessly outclassed working class 
youngsters. This is an uneven balance, particularly since, like most battles, it comes under the guise of righteousness. And this is from Kenneth Clark. So, uh, and Huey draws on this to, to uh, preface his, his chapter. <coughs> so, he begins. Because we moved around a lot when I was growing up, I attended almost every grammar and junior high school in the city of Oakland and had wide experience with the kind of education Oakland offers its poor people. At the time, I did not understand the size or seriousness of the school system's assault on black people. I knew only that I constantly felt uncomfortable and ashamed of being black. This feeling followed me everywhere without let up. It was a result of the implicit understanding in the system that whites were smart and blacks were stupid. Anything presented as good was always white, even the stories teachers gave us to read in the early grades, like Black Sambo, Little Red Riding Hood, and Snow White and the Seven Dwarves told us we were. I remember my reaction to Little Black Sambo. Sambo was first of all a coward. When confronted by tigers, he gave up the presents from his father without a struggle. First the, sorry, umbrella, then the beautiful crimson felt-lined shoes, everything until he had nothing left. And afterward, Sambo only wanted to eat pancakes. He was totally unlike the courageous white knight who rescued Sleeping Beauty. The knight was our sim symbol of purity, while Sambo stood for humiliation and gluttony. Time after time, we heard the story of little black Sambo. We did not want to laugh, but finally we did, to hide our shame, accepting Sambo as a symbol of what blackness was all about. We simply did not feel capable of learning what the white kids could learn. From the beginning, everyone, including us, judged smart blacks in terms of how they compared with whites, whether they could read or do arithmetic as well as the white kids. Whites were the standard of comparison in all things, even personal uh, attractiveness. By the third or fourth grade, when we began to do simple mathematics, I had learned to maneuver my way around the teachers. It was a simple matter to put pressure on the white kids to do my arithmetic and spelling assignments. The feeling that we could not learn this material was a general attitude amongst black children in every public school I ever attended. Predictably, the sense of despair and futility led us into rebellious attitudes. Rebellion was the only way we knew to cope with the suffocating, repressive atmosphere that undermined our confidence. So I just want to stop there. But um, I just thought reading that section to me was so, excuse me, so powerful uh, and spoke so much to, I think, the realities that students face today. Um, and. Um, but I just want to return to my thoughts now. James Baldwin had a concept called the New Jerusalem. In the New Jerusalem, he said that the people would build a kingdom of heaven, a kingdom of heaven on earth. In, in Saturday Free School, we talk about uh, ascending to the concrete, and it's like ascending to the kingdom of heaven, but also concrete, it's on earth, you know? And um, I, I just love this idea so much and uh, this was his way of talking about the new world um, that awaited um, being, you know, being built. Um, two moments, okay, thank you. And uh, let me just skip through this part. Um, The new Jerusalem is not possible without love. We must be utterly frank with ourselves that to love one another is the most powerful thing we can do as human beings. Love binds us to each other across time and space as beings in the universe. It compels us to manifest that which we wish for in the innermost chambers of our soul. The freedom to reach our most noble striving to fulfill that most acute longing, the, uh, the liberation of the dark nations from the bitter yoke of oppression. Under capitalism, we are forced to walk around with masks over our faces. We are made to engage with one another through requisite poses of civility. But love, as James Baldwin so wisely opined, takes off the false masks that long stay our faces. It shows us who we are, and not only that, it shows us who we can be together. To love in this way is the most 
uh, is the way of revolutionary suicide, Huey Newton's most brilliant theory of existence. But to love suicidally does not mean that we seek to die, he said. That is the way of reactionary suicide, which has taken too many of our dear ones from us. As Newton says in his thesis, the concept of revolutionary suicide is not defeatist or fatalistic. On the contrary, it conveys an awareness of reality in combination with the possibility of hope. Reality because rev the revolutionary must always be prepared to face death and hope because it symbolizes a resolute determination to bring about change. Above all, it demands that the revolutionary see his death and his life as one piece." Unquote. Here, Newton refers to Mao's point that death comes to all, but it varies its, in its significance. To die for the reactionary, Mao said, uh, is lighter than a feather. To die for the revolution is heavier than Mount Tai. Um, so uh, Huey wrote The Correct Handling of the Revolution based on Mao's essay, The Correct Handling of the Contradictions Amongst the People. Um, and M Mao here argued that in the process of building socialism in any country, contradictions are bound to emerge amongst people. To imagine that no contradictions existed amongst the people, he said, is a naive idea, which is at variance with the ob objective reality. We are confronted with two types of social contradictions. Uh, one is the ones between ourselves and the enemy, but the other is the contradictions that exist amongst ourselves, which we also have to work very hard to resolve. And I want to suggest that love is the most powerful way we can do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, revolutionary love and um, oh, and revolutionary love. <laughs> revolutionary, sorry. <laughs> and um, and it's, it's the power of love and, and the love that the people had for Huey Newton and, and the love that Huey Newton and so many revolutionaries who were, you know, assassinated by the state had. That was so threatening, you know, that was so threatening and so powerful. And I think we, we cannot underestimate that. Um, as he wrote in a chapter titled Loving in his magnificent work, Revolutionary Suicide, in the party we have formed a family fighting, uh, formed a family, a fighting family that is a vital unit in itself. We have no romantic and fictional notions about getting married and living happily ever after behind a white picket fence. We chose to live together for a common purpose and together we fight for existence and our goals. Today, we have the closeness, the harmony, and the freedom we have sought so long. I am grateful that Huey does not idealize love. Rather, he sees it as a human ex exchange full of contradictions and something that needs to be worked through. And anything human, as we know, is bound to be imperfect. The great hope of his theory of revolutionary suicide is its grounding in the philosophy of a deep love for humanity, which is the key force for maintaining the momentum of any protracted struggle for freedom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Divya. I just did it again. So next up, we will have Autumn. Yay! Awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so my name is Autumn Sellers Leon. I am. This oh, this one's better. Yeah, okay. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so I'm a graduate student in anthropology here at Temple University, um, and before I get going, I just thought I'd ask a field question if there are other graduate students here. Oh, okay, so a few, great. Um, maybe some graduate school refugees, right? Um, and uh, we'll talk about that, right? And I ask that for two reasons, or I say that for two reasons. Uh, about the graduate students. One is if you are a graduate student or anyone else, I just want to plug really quick that we have a black reconstruction reading group that meets every Thursday this fall from three to five on the second floor of Gladfelter. Um, so you're all welcome. Um, and the second reason is that a lot of what I have to say comes from my experience as a graduate student. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about that um, a little bit 
Um, so first off, thank you so much um, to Brandon and the Black and Brown Coalition for organizing this. Um, you guys are the vanguard of the student movement here in Philadelphia. Nobody else is doing this. So thank you so much for this. <sighs> So the purpose of this panel is to talk about um, education for liberation and some of the contradictions in the academic world. Um, and one of the things I want to focus on coming out of this experience as uh, a hopefully soon to be over experience as a graduate student is um, what I'm calling this manufacture of fatalism. Okay. Fatalism, and I had to look this up, okay, right, um, is the belief that all events are determined and therefore inevitable, okay? Um, and I think that being a graduate student has given me a particular personal stake in this issue, but I, I think the insight is open to anyone who has passed through the halls and classrooms of the university and felt this cognitive and emotional dissonance and started asking questions, right? Um, so I wanna set up a contrast between this manufacture of fatalism and education for liberation. Um, and what comes to mind um, for me is uh, the opening statement of the Saturday Free School's mission statement embodied in the uh, the mission statement of the People's Mirror, where we talk about the New Jerusalem, right? Um, and this is the idea that we can build a new civilization amid the ruins of capitalism, imperialism, and white supremacy. And for this idea, I can only be really grateful. Um, and in this, fr from this experience of being a graduate student, um, we have talked about how the seeds for this new civilization or this new Jerusalem already exist in the community. Um, and I think that I have found and would really like to share this with other graduate students, but also faculty um, or anyone who's trying to do something in, in all of this, um, that if you want to lead your life as an intellectual, you need the community. Right. Um, not only to be really an intellectual, but also for your sanity, right? Yeah. Um, so let me talk about why. Okay. Um, I came to the, I came to graduate school really skeptical. Um, neither of my parents graduated college, so I didn't even know what a graduate student was um, when I signed up. And if you ask why I came here at all under those conditions, it was because I was unemployed and getting paid $15,000 to be a teaching assistant per year was better than going into debt $30,000 a year to be a doctor, which is what I would have done in any other society, but you can't um, under these conditions. So, And of course, something attracted me to the social sciences, right? Um, but I still had these reservations about this notion of the ivory tower, um, intellectual and this voyeuristic ethnographer, ideas that were kind of ironically reinforced in this postmodern milieu, like this very guilt-ridden milieu of academic anthropology, but still had no alternative suggestion, right? Um, which is part of the fatalism, right? This postmodernist fatalism in academia. Um, but as it turned out, it was the community that taught me to love anthropology. That is the study of what a human is and our past and present. So in the first undergraduate class I ever taught, um, which, you know, wasn't that long ago for some people, but it feels really long ago now. That was about six years ago. <laughs> We read excerpts from Franz Boas and Herbert Louis Spencer, who were both 19th century anthropologists, and this was a matter of course, right? It was a Fundamentals of Anthropology course. Um, and we talked about how anthropologists at that time categorized 
groups of people according to whether they were civilized, barbaric, or savages, right? And I, you know, um, and the, uh, uh, the subtext to that um, is that this is a really messed up way to categorize societies. So let's just talk about, we only talk about 19th century anthropologists to talk about how messed up they were. Um, not any of the bigger questions that were happening in the 19th century, right? Um, so I had a student, um, an African-American student from here in Philadelphia who said, I wanna write a paper on how our, our society, parenthetically white society, is barbaric. And I was like, I don't know if that was the point of what I was trying to say, but sure, yeah, go ahead, right? Um, and it was a great paper, you know? It completely flipped this like postmodernist script. We don't talk about race or the past or future of civilizations, you know, anymore in anthropology, just these really small, you know, small questions. I also had another student who was from North Philadelphia um, and he wrote his ethnography paper on the Norris homes, which um, are currently scheduled to be demolished in April of next year. Um, and he didn't know anyone at the Norris homes, but he had this opportunity to get to know more about his neighborhood. Um, and he got a lot out of it, right? So I'm having these students like from Philadelphia, the community, that are saying, you know, there's something really interesting in what you're teaching us. So, okay, all right. And I would say, you know, when I would tell people when I'm out and about, like I study anthropology, and I don't even know what that means because I don't, I don't, I just, I'm just doing grad school, right? It's just a job, but I would get responses that were really respectful of anthropology, right? And people would talk to me about civilizations and Africa and all these things that I didn't know anything about, you know. And um, but what I learned was that anthropology, the study of humans, what they are, their history and their future, matters most to people who feel like they have a stake in the narrative, right? That that is where they fit in the narrative actually matters to them. And if I can say for a moment, I just wanna read from Du Bois Black Reconstruction where he affirms this for the African American community in particular. And I, I hope we can talk about this sometime in the reading group. Um, this is from his chapter on founding the public school. Okay, and he says, the eagerness to learn among American Negroes was exceptional in the case of a poor and recently emancipated folk, right, during Reconstruction. Usually, with a protective psychology, such degraded masses regard ignorance as natural and necessary, or even exalt their own traditional wisdom and discipline over quote-unquote book learning. Or they assume that knowledge is for higher beings and not for the likes of us. American Negroes never acted thus. The very feeling of inferiority which slavery forced upon them fathered an intense desire to rise out of their condition by means of education. Of the 400, this is important, these, you know, Doc says that these numbers, these numbers are really important, right? So, of the 488,070 free Negroes in the United States in 1860, 32,629 were attending school and only 91,736 were unable to read and write. In the slave states, there were 3,651 colored children attending schools supported by the free Negroes. So there's that love for learning. Okay, and this is, this is about, this is for anyone where civilization matters, okay? So this value that the community or that any human being should put into this narrative has no room for this fatalism that such an endeavor is only as good as something as abstract as the market says it is. 
What's crazy is how much in these halls of academia, people up and down have literally, literally bought into this notion and there's cynicism all around. And at the top ranks, you get these people who come to departments or, you know, my, my college of liberal arts with these, you know, uh, innovative ideas about how to restructure the PhD, like do a multimedia presentation or uh, rap your PhD, make it a rap album, dance your PhD, <coughs> right? Because the thesis, because this is the idea, the thesis just isn't relevant anymore. That's how fatalistic it is, right? I'm not kidding. They pay people who are like, you know, at the end of their career, twiddling their thumbs, thinking about how they can make, how they can make this experience more entertaining for people because it sucks so bad, right? Anyway, in the meantime, they're getting retirement and all of these things, so whatever. But here's the, here's, that's one thing, but here's the thing that has really been blowing my mind lately is that um, when you get local, right, and you're talking to faculty and, and students, there's this other situation that I'm calling a willful misdiagnosis, okay? Um, and this comes out of a series of conversations that I've been having with my colleagues and faculty um, in the department and other places. And here's the thing that I've heard is that the reason that the university can't uh, be all the things that we want it to be, in particular for the social sciences and liberal arts, is because of this magical thing called responsibility-centered management. Has anybody heard this before? I got two minutes? I get okay. Okay. Um, all right. Actually, this won't take that long. So, um, Responsibility-centered management allegedly is based on this notion that each college department's budget is determined by the money they bring in, especially through undergraduate enrollment, right? That is how many butts and seats for cash your department can bring in. So we do this thing where we have to hustle our discipline to 18-year-olds that I didn't know what it was, so I don't know how they know, you know? Contingent faculty and graduate students are fearful of how much this game is tied to our ability to eat, pay rent, and get health care. And we are, by and large, doing most of the work of keeping this system going. Okay? Now, here's the thing that blew my mind. Yesterday, or this was, well, it was yesterday, actually, I was in a conversation with a couple of admin <coughs> faculty in my, administrative faculty in my uh, realm. And they're going on about credit hours and faculty salaries and, you know, that all make up part of this equation about what kind of resources our department, our anthropology department can get. And I say, so what's this equation? Can we see it? And he says, no. And I was like, why not? He says, no one can. No one knows what it is. They don't know. And I'm saying that there is this equation that exists somewhere that once a finite number of variables is plugged into it, it tells us when we are deserving of resources and when we are not as a department and as a program, but we're not allowed to see it. And I say, how do you even know that this equation exists? How do we know that there is this proportionate relationship between what we're bringing in and what we're getting? How do we know that this is not some kind of lifeboat game in which a small group of people have come up with a new way of using just one half of an equation to make arbitrary decisions about giving resources to a program? And his response is just kind of a shrug, that fatalism. And I say, you know, there's not a formula. This equation does not exist. Rather, what exists is this mysterious black box of power, okay? So the problem is not whether or not this formula or equation exists. It's not even the question of whether, it's not the question of whether or not it exists. The problem is that it has a name right now and it's responsibility-centered management, right? 
And my peers, my faculty, my colleagues, my union believe that it exists. And the craziest part of it is that they have us all believing that this formula has the power to determine the value of our work. It has us all believing that our work is as good as 18 year olds who think it is worth going into debt for. So, but here's the thing, it's easier to believe that this formula exists rather than trying to touch that black box of power. This is the manufacture of fatalism, this notion that there's nothing we can do about it because there's, a, there's, a, there's an equation somewhere. So I just think one of the things, on the, once we leave the academy and people hear this, you know, that they, on the outside people come at us at the free school and say that we're the ones that are attacking the academy, that it's not us, we're not destroying it at all, um, it's them. So, um, so one of the ways that we also get fatalistic is that we think that we can just leave, right? Well, let's just get a job at an NGO or do something else, right? Um, or a government contract job, whatever. And so, um, We talked a little bit last week about the refugee, or, I call them refugees, no I'm sorry, about the work that we do and what work we're trying to save in this society and there's something, you know, that we have to be careful. There is, this is valuable work that we're doing, right? Um, and the question is, are we going to give in to this notion that we're not necessary, that the same thing that the institution wants us to believe, and this groveling at their doors for any bit of a class that they can throw at us to pay our bills, that's the question. Are we going to just give in to that? You know? Or are we, um, we need to get at that black box, right, of power. And we can't be defeated by this notion that education is only as good as people are willing to pay for it. Okay, and I know I'm over time, so I'm just gonna jump to my gratitude statement. <clears throat> I have these books up here um, to show how much I love. I learned to love books. I learned to, relearn to love books because I love them so much as a child, but school and graduate school make books a source of anxiety. How much you read, how much you stayed up all night like trying to get your paper done, you know, and not of joy and most importantly hope. And this notion that the people who wrote them like Huey Newton and Du Bois and Freire can show us the way to that new Jerusalem. I learned to love books uh, again, I learned to love learning from the community who said it is not only our job to learn, but to teach, share, and curate knowledge. I learned what joy and the possibility of hope it is to learn, but also what a responsibility it is. How necessary it is that, how much that when you actually read these books, you find that where you may have been frustrated with the lack of knowledge in, commun in the community, it's actually that this lack of knowledge was manufactured, right? So, and then once people know the truth of their story, once you know why you have this cognitive dissonance, you know, and this emotional dissonance in the institution, then, you can begin to act, right? So thank you again to uh, the Free School, to Brandon, to Dr. Gina Jennings um, for that story this morning about Huey Newton bursting into that black box and saying, this is what we want, you know, and that's what we have to keep doing. So thank you very much. Adam, so up next, Adia. Yeah. Peace, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for coming. We're really excited to have you here. Um, I'm sure everyone is learning a lot and feeling all the love in the room. So 
Um, before, real quick, I get started uh, on the official speech. I wanted to kind of um, lay out the kind of framework that I had um, going into <coughs> this, knowing when Brandon had told me about being on the panel for education, for liberation and knowledge, and after you know being at the free school, that kind of was just so natural to me. So I was ready to go. Um, but when I did some reflecting, I did realize a few things about just my entire experience, and I had been realizing it, you know, a lot. That uh, as soon as I had graduated college, gotten that degree, did like, you know, the entire show, um, I went home and I was like, I don't know anything. <laughs> I didn't learn about myself. I, you know, I changed in, in terms of that black politic thing that, that kind of happens very easily in college, thanks to Huey and to Bunchy and to John and to um, the entire of the Black Panther Party for setting that up. But um, I did feel this sense, like Autumn says, of dissonance, of this wasn't the full truth, that I wasn't always getting it, but this is what was needed to happen, to push me through, to get me through the thing. But I had a lot more respect for myself than that. And I thought that this, is, this couldn't be it. And I didn't want to go to grad school because I wasn't trying to you know, get 30 more thousand dollars in debt to learn nothing again. <laughs> um, so when I had joined the Saturday Free School about two years ago or whenever, um, it feels like it's just been part of my life forever. Um, it taught me really about learning and education and what that actually meant. And when you have someone like Yvonne King at the, the, the Saturday Free School, you know, showing you what the Black Panther Party was, not just telling you, not just educating you on it, but demonstrating that throughout ideology, through you know, the different conversations that we have, really teaches you more about the party than any of these, than I, I would even give Black Studies right now credit to give. Um, and I definitely learned to see the party um, as a human invention, as something that people got together and they did. It wasn't perfect, it didn't need to be perfect. That's not the focus. The focus was, was what did they do that made them so revolutionary? So what I had realized um, after, the, after the free school and, and you know, going through all these moments, because I really had joined towards the end of my college career, um, which is funny that I'm calling it that, right? But that's how um, I see it. Uh, uh, I had kind of joined, so I had already been through you know, some AF, AFAM department kind of study courses. Um, you know, never read Du Bois, never even read Huey, never even read Baldwin, to be honest. Um, so I don't know what we were talking about then, but somehow I made it through. <laughs> and what I basically learned was, education in black America is synonymous with community empowerment. Education in white America is synonymous with indoctrinization. As you we found, and I, as I have found, and as a countless number of others who are unjustly indebted to private and federal loans have found, the universities have failed, almost purposely, to prepare anyone properly for the tools to understand, overcome, and transform humanity. Right. By mentally destroying and incapitating, uh, incapitating us, they sterilize the mind. For the average person, the price is too high, the investment is not enough, and that little sheet of paper matters little. For those that make the mark, the investment requires more than you bargained for. No longer are you a person, but a brand at every corner. Where you come from has turned into what's your background? <laughs> and what you've gone through becomes your leverage. Where does, that leave the, where does that leave the invested? It leaves them unable to accept the reality bestowed upon them. They, can't, they cannot and will not accept the truth. As the voice says, they are stuck in the syllogism of the satisfied. <laughs> Quote, and this is them. This cannot be true. This is not true. If it were true, I would not believe it. If it is true, I do not believe it. Therefore, it is false. And that's the mindset they go under. The Black Panther Party was clear which education they were about and for whom. As we have seen displayed so phenomenally throughout this conference, Community engagement was central to the Black Panther Party's mission. When Huey envisioned the party, he at first may have seen a nationalist movement, but as he grew, he saw the importance of what he called revolutionary intercommunalism, and what we've been talking about all day today. 
or the principled unity of the communities throughout the world against the common enemy of white supremacy. Of white supremacy. Huey credits his ideology um, to Malcolm X, a man who had educated himself in prison and became, to the white world, one of the most infamous civil rights leaders. To, the black, to black America, he was an exceptionally principled, disciplined, and fearless leader of the plight for human liberation. The most important aspect, oops, the most important aspect of, develop, of the development of Huey and Malcolm's ideology is their self-education. In the same vein of comrades George Jackson, through reading the world, through reading, sorry, they could see that the world could be viewed critically, historically, and synthetically. Huey understood this, and when conceptualizing the 10-point program, education of the masses was crucial when he stated in point number five, we want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches our true history and our role in present day society. As the Panthers understood it, white supremacy was not an individual attack upon the darker people of America, but a system that diminished the humanity and livelihood of this specific community. Black and working class Americans were at the very bottom of the system. They held the entirety of white supremacy together, but it is at the cost of their labor, humanity, and self-determination that all these establishments are built upon. They understood themselves and the community they served as the forefront for liberation of all those affected by the white supremacist system. In order to arm themselves, they took up the gun, and most importantly, the book, as Huey also states. So therefore, and in my experience, have come to the conclusion that appealing to those adamantly invested in academics proves difficult, for their minds have been made up and their investment has been made. They are meant to be scholars, scientists, philosophers. However, they, all they have become are purveyors of white supremacy. Now, do not mistake my criticism. I neither over-exaggerate nor will apologize for it. I stand for those I stand to hold those in academia accountable for their actions. Here at Temple University, the African Mer American Studies Department and Afrocology is riddled with purveyors of white supremacy. The works and accomplishments of the Black Panther Party are held in whispers between these curi those curious enough to research outside the box. The crucial contributions and ideology of W.E.B. Du Bois are kept silent under the condemning and erasing guise of identity politics. Instead, the focus is on the coulda, woulda, shoulda, and not on what is. The revolution is what's happening, and the work that needs to take place is what needs to be done. Now, education provides the tools to help solve bigger problems, and the biggest problem now is the illiter illiteracy forced ignorance, and systematic oppression of black America by white America. The Black Panther Party already identified the problem. They conceptualized solutions and proved that the power of the people is, in, is the biggest threat to white America. They showed what it means to be armed with books, ideology, and love for humanity, and what that could mean for them. They showed us what it means to be black, what it means to be human, because to be black is to be human. Great. <laughs> so up next we have Kashara. Peace, everybody. Um, I just want to thank my comrades for their amazing perspectives on this, on like education and like just thanks everybody for coming to this because Huey's like a huge influence for me personally as an activist and just as a human being, but um, I really want to talk about my experience in the African American Studies program because it's Gabe alluded to. Oh, my bad. Um, I really want to talk about my experience in African American Studies um, because as, Gabe, uh, as Elias talked about, um, there is, it has to be taken very seriously. It should be taken really seriously that 
uh, anti-communism and anti-socialism is being promoted in the African American Studies Whoa. Department. It sh that should be taken here at, taken that here at Temple University. That that should be taken really, really seriously. And actually, it should be taken extremely serious because we know who the chair is, and the chair of this department um, is on the board of several. <coughs> uh, elementary schools that teach um, that have all African students in them uh, Emotet like uh, high schools as well that that are promoting cultural nationalism and other forms of Afrocentric thought right and so that has to be taken seriously what does it mean to have a, a, a vision for black liberation without an economic plan for black people what does it mean when Dr. Asante says in, says in his book that Africology or no Afrocentricity is classless, but doesn't go on to explain anything about what that actually looks like. So I think that um, me talking about my experience in African American studies really kind of will give you guys an idea of one, what the Montero struggle was really all about. Right. Number one, and number two there is a historical connection on what happened in this campus in 2013 2014 and 15 and what happened at the at uh, ucla when bunchy carter and john Huggins were living. so it's very it's very difficult for me to talk about some of this stuff just because it's my life and uh I feel like to some degree, I, I keep kind of telling this story over and over to different people, but it seems like the same people because it's still at Temple. So, <laughs> um, so um, when I changed my major to African American Studies, I was open to a world of thought that centered black experiences. So just to give you all an idea for, of where I'm from, I'm from Mansion. Like, y'all know where Strawberry Mansion is in Philadelphia? Yes. That's where I'm from. I went to the high school there. That high school has a, a reputation, right? And in the city, and so does the area. It's one of the poorest zip codes in the in the city. We're sitting in one one nine one two one one nine one two one nine one one two and one nine one two two are two of the poorest zip codes in Philadelphia. And Temple operates in one nine one two two. So, just to give you an idea of the type of of, of how the the power that Temple has in this area is absolute because it's all poor people here. It's nobody that owns their house. They could just, it's absolute, it's nothing. Uh, so in my education, me coming up, I had black teachers. I had probably just as many black teachers as I had white teachers. And everybody treated blackness as pathology, as Huey describes it. You're pathological because you're black. You're poor because you're black. You can't read because you're black. Like these are, this is what all black people know. This is the system of education in America. So when I got to AFAM, I was amazed. Like, it was just so much, first of all, Africology, and I, 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 I'm critical of Africology, but the reason why I'm critical of it is because it influenced me. And so Africology is a, well, I would say it's like a way of, of approaching scholarship, right? And so fundamentally what it does is places the African as the agent and it's, it stops looking at black people as pathological necessarily. And so moving, proceeding from that point, now I can look at, now I can read a book about myself and I have to look at myself as the problem, right? But Du Bois did that before Africology was even thought of. So we really don't have to go, but, but this is, the, this is a, the, the school of thought that I'm coming up under because I'm in African American Studies at Temple. And I just want to make myself clear. Like I graduated high school in 2010, so, um, and I came in and out of school money. Like, so um, I just want to be clear that Africology uh, was just one of the many schools of thought at the time. In 2010, it was, everybody was here. It was, uh, Black womanists, Africana womanists, all types of different uh, ideologies. You had uh, Pan Africanists, Afrocentrists, Afri uh, Black Socialists, and Communists. Everybody was in one department. There was open debate. Everybody studied together. People had problems with each other. They talked about their the problems that they had. And so, what I loved about the department was there were Garveyites instead of Jeffersonians. <laughs> like we, we read Fanon instead of Aristotle like everybody in if you had sense you were reading Asada's book like that's how the 
act from on the on the academic level. Like I'm not even talking about activism. Like I'm talking about just reading books, writing papers, the regular shit that everybody does in school, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so everybody collaborated. And so for me, like Huey, reading Revolutionary Suicide was like a huge eye opener because it was my first introduction really into cl into class. Like I really didn't um, have a class analysis. Like legit, we had spent like two semesters on adinkra symbols and shit like that. So like, <laughs> like I'm, I'm just being real about the stuff that I'm worried about as a black person from North Philly is not adinkra symbols and like the fabric and shit, like fabric. But you could buy fabric and I'm gonna get that. <laughs> so, uh, so when I read Huey, I kind of got this this new analysis. It's, and my first reading of the book is I step away from it. I'm like, okay, I can't just talk about this stuff. I gotta be about it. I have to do something. And it just so happened that at that time, the graduate students were they hosted a rally where Dr. Montero spoke. I was in his class, like. We were, we were, we were really thinking. Like let's be real. Like we were really thinking. We were really learning. And um, a big part of that was the fact that we had uh, um, the philosophy circle, which eventually led to the Saturday school. So like we, the um, Black Radical Philosophy Circle was something that we got a lot of bullshit for. <laughs> um, but we tried to. Um, excuse my. I'm just saying excuse my language in advance because this is my life. Like so. Um, the philosophy circle we kind of, we started out of our out of studying in class, and what what happened is just what happens at the Saturday school is we would invite the community as well as students from different disciplines, not just African American studies, um, to study philosophy. All, um, and we studied the boys, we studied uh, Huey, we studied we did everything, we studied everybody, and, and we didn't just focus on black thinkers, but we also focused on critiquing other um, thinkers, and especially European thinkers in our critiques, anyway. Uh, so, so the graduate students host a rally to save black studies. Why do black studies need to be saved? So as an undergraduate student, I'm thinking, well, there's a core class that I have, like I needed to graduate, and they're only offering it one semester out the year, and it's at 6.30 in the evening. <coughs> Stuff like that. That's what's happening to us. We don't have a lot of resources. We don't have a lot of like respect from the administration. And uh, we were losing faculty left and right. And um, as a result of us losing faculty so much, like we, the chair who had uh, retired, there was, there was a void. Somebody needed to be the chair of the department. And apparently they wanted to make a white woman the chair instead of one of the professors who were already tenured. And so fight ensues over the department. The graduate students uh, support the faculty by, because oh, we talked about this earlier. Carrie Amin Welsh, that's who we wanted to be the chair. We would still like her to be the chair. If we could get that campaign going today, like, because it's really trash. Like, I really, I don't like, I guess I feel like a troll of the department because, like, it's really trash. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so Carrie Amu Welsh, we wanted her to be the chair. They wanted some other lady to be the chair. It was like this really systemic way that they were just trying to slide her in without nobody seeing. And so like, obviously we're not stupid. And so uh, grad students rally, the undergrad students rally. And from there, I kind of started being an activist. And so like all the young people who were part of that first rally ended up creating um, multiple other organizations from that point on that will follow in the years that, well, I would kind of call it the struggle to uh, save the department, which at first it was about not getting a white woman in this chair, but eventually it turned into this, um, this struggle uh, in this internal conflict about cultural nationalism or revolutionary socialism, right? And that's really what the bottom line is when we talk about uh, Asante and Montero. Uh, what else? So, like, why should you even become an activist? The reason is really simple. Um, and Huey kind of draws these things out, and I want to actually read from his uh, his speech, "The Correct Handling of a Revolution." And so, there are a few um, concrete reasons that a student 
who's just trying to get their, you know, get their degrees in, should be an activist. And and uh, I, I want to say that it's because your education should be one rooted in liberation. So if you don't, if you adhering to this sort of academic understanding of what your education is supposed to be, then maybe you shouldn't be an activist because it, should, it don't really matter. But if you want liberation for all people, if you want liberation of humanity, then you should definitely get down with this stuff that he was talking about. And so the first thing is learn by doing. Huey says, there are three ways one can learn. Through study, observation, and experience. To learn by studying is good, but to learn by experience is better. So like everything that I'm about to tell y'all about how what happened to John Huggins and Butchie Carter connects back to what happened at Temple's campus, it's not because I read a book. It's not because I heard a lecture. It's not because I listened to prison radio even. It's because I literally lived it and I walked through it and I saw it happen. So like when uh, Dr. Regina is telling us that they came in there with guns, I'm telling y'all that the people who snitch on me to the cops is the, these same folks. You know what I'm saying? So like that, that's what the connection is. All right, so... um. The other thing is you, you have to learn to lead by example. The purpose of the vanguard is to lead the people. The primary job of the party, this is what Huey says, is to provide leadership for the people. It must teach by words and action and um, the correct strategy, strategy, strategic methods for prolonged resistance. This, um, Baldwin, Baldwin, James Baldwin, he has this, uh, this phrase called the long mean time. He talks about there being this this sort of space between our subjugation and our and our liberation being the long meantime. That means you have to work towards it. It's going to be generations until we get it. But every generation makes certain steps forward. Like what the Panthers did is infamous. Like they changed the whole world. And so activists like Bunchy Carter, that's what they that's what we do. So um what was I about to say? Uh Oh yeah, so my issue with a lot of the people in uh, African American studies today is that these people might speak about liberation, but when they say liberation, they don't have a concrete definition. Huey and the Black Panther Party had a very concrete definition of what they meant by liberation. Along with that, cultural nationalists, well, I, Afrocentricity. Who has it liberated on the planet? Think about it. Like, what political prisoners do y'all know was, is in jail right now because they are Afrocentric? <laughs> think, think, think about it. Like, you cannot lead, you, you can't tell me that what you're doing is leadership, but you haven't led nobody. Where are the Afrocentric uh, uh, marches, right? Where are the Afrocentrist uh, free breakfast clubs? Where are the book clubs? Where where do the, they just want you to buy, buy their books. That's how I see it. And I'm from North Philly and I know a hustler when I see a hustler. So. <laughs> <laughs> the other practical reason to become an activist is because to be war ready, you have to be battle tested. Right. Huey says to minimize the danger of Uncle Tom informers and opportunists, the members of the Vanguard group should be tested revolutionaries. That means that you can't just leave college and just join a, a socialist party. You can't just leave college and, and decide like and, and elevate yourself a bunch of uh, around a bunch of black people and decide like I'm this messiah. I've seen like all types of stuff that's happening in the world right now around this this black shit, this black this black stuff, right? I've seen some young people they done moved down to uh, Central America. Now they all locked up because they following some man uh, with locks and and you know he got a nice chest or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like I've seen these people create these cults of personalities, and now you got people shipped to another country, and they. They messed up. They think that they're doing something for liberation. They think that they're doing something progressive, but really what they're doing is feeding this person's ego right. at their own expense of their life. And it's not different in the university. It's not different in these schools. And so um, I'll, I'll just tell y'all this short story. 
we're knee deep in the in the Montero struggle, and so some activists had this idea that we're gonna take over Sullivan Hall. We did it before we could do it again, right? That's what we said. And we had this really bad plan where we're gonna go into the blocks and collection and act like we're all studying. Like everybody, stu like 40 of us are gonna go study in the blocks and collection, whatever. <laughs> but so like maybe like six or seven of us show up to the blocks in like during our little time slots that we have all planned out. And lie to you not, the person who, whoop, whoop, like that person was a, what, was a person in the, um, at, in the AFAM department, we knew the, that person well. We knew that once there started to become split amongst the black people, because everybody was together when it was against the white lady. But then once, once it becomes split against the black people, we knew that this person wasn't necessarily on our side. But deep in my heart, I didn't think, if anything, you would confront me. Like, yo, why are you in here? Like, get out. But no, they didn't do that, none of that. They called the, they called the folks on us. Yeah. And so it's not that... I don't want to make it seem that what happened on this campus is anywhere on the magnitude of what happened to the Panthers. But I, I, can, I can say and I can point out faces and I can say names of the people who the same folks that attacked us for literally the same things that they were doing. We were setting up breakfast programs. We were setting up book clubs. We were, we were trying to do all those things because we're trying to follow in Huey's footsteps and in Angela's footsteps, and in Asada's footsteps. That's what we saw ourselves doing. The same, these same people are now running the Department of African American Studies, and so what does that mean about education? What does that mean for our education that we're gonna be receiving? It means that it's inherently anti-communist. It means that they can talk about Fanon, but they don't talk about Fanon. It means they can mention Fanon, but to discredit his socialist, uh, background they talk about his white wife right or they or and anything I think any descent becomes an African right if you slap not it's not African on it then black kids and I, and I think it's really important to say that black youth are very much so empowered and I think the cultural nationalists they they use our ignorance they use our vulnerability the fact that we feel we, everybody feels some type of way that they don't know their history, that it's been taken from them. And they use that to prey on us, like to say like, I have these solutions. Right. But the solutions are very much individualistic. They're very much um, like, uh, it's about you trying to make money. Like I, I, I got cornered and knee deep in the Montero uh, struggle and these same folks corner me in their office and talk to me for hours and hours and try to flip me on my comrades, telling me that they can, you know, make sure I graduate and get, you know, whatever the case is, whatever they think that they can give me. Like, but I guess, um, I guess it's easier, I guess, well, what I can say is, them flipping you is easier when you don't know Huey and when you don't know Du Bois and when you haven't read Asada. It is, because I didn't get flipped. I ain't going nowhere, I'm still here. So it's so much easier because you don't know, like especially, and they use their academic students in general, where they use their book knowledge to try to make you feel stupid, and like the decisions that you're making with your life is stupid. But the thing about it is, is the knowledge that Huey and Elaine and all the Panthers passed down to us, it can be applied, you can actually use it in the world and you will see results. You will get your friends out of jail where they don't belong. You, you will, you will liberate your community. You will feed people who are hungry. You will literally change the world. That's, and that's the thing. These people don't wanna change the world. They just wanna change how they can move in it. That's very important. Cultural nationalists don't wanna change the world. It's about, it's about not changing the relationship between capital and humanity but it's it's about changing the it's about changing the relationship between how white people see black people like oh like and they even say things like we should be more like the indians because people respect indian culture right people respect but that's what it's about it's about respecting somebody's culture as it is but I mean they use words that, that say like they're not juxtaposing themselves to white supremacy or, or Eurocentricity. But what does that mean if you're not going to 
say like, hey, that's wrong and it's right, well, then what are we really saying about the about the world that we live in? And I think that there's so much I want to say. I think that um, I think that it's really important to see this as the the re the main reason that uh, cultural nationalism is accepted by white supremacy. Why is it embraced? Mm -hmm. One, because they'll snitch on you. Mm -hmm. They will tell the pub. They will tell the administration what you're doing. Two, it's because and why would they snitch? Because they want money. It's about being having a positive relationship to capitalism. And there, and I want to kind of touch on this too, their black nationalism is not Huey's black nationalism. I don't think, nationalism is not inherently wrong. Because that's not what I'm trying to say. Nationalism is not inherently wrong, but it's a way of going about it. And so um, Huey, he always had a way with words. And so um, he endearingly called cultural nationalism pork chop nationalism. <laughs> and the way that I would describe this ideology is an ideology that claimed that rediscovering some supposedly unitary African culture would uh, simultaneously lead to, a, or would um, eventually lead to a revolution. So if all of the Africans in Africa and all of the Africans uh, in the diaspora practice the same African culture uh, or synthesize this culture, right? Then we would just have a revolution. That's, that's it. And so all them classes y'all about to play, pay for, that's it. That's it. Because they, no, they don't have no countries under a banner of cultural nationalism that have been liberated because of cultural nationalism. They don't have a Cuba. They don't have an equivalent. They don't have an equivalent to the Angolan Revolution. They don't have an equivalent. It doesn't exist. So that's literally it. <clears throat> what we want to fight for in our education and in our um, in our histori historiography of the world is revolutionary socialism. We want people to understand the ideology which claims that there is no way accept a revolution to end this system. There is no other way. The only way that we can end this system is if we have a revolution, and the only way we can have a revolution is if we build it. It's not gonna come out the clear blue sky, and we'll come out of, we're not gonna think about, we're not gonna see it on our Adinkra symbols. It's not, come. it's not, no. We have to build it, we gotta put in the work. We have to be uncomfortable, and uh, we have to challenge the education that we've been given. It's a, to, in order to educate ourselves truly, we have to decolonize our education. And to do that, we cannot replace one um, toxic cultural perspective with another cultural perspective that, which I think, um, I feel like they do this thing, and I call it a cocktail, because I like to keep stuff simple. They take something over here from this country, something over there from that country, put it all together, shake it up in a cocktail, now that's Africa. I, I don't I don't agree with that. I think there are many cultures and and I think that academia allows you to do this thing where you're like um, where they can really go really deep, right? You can go really deep and there's this so this f deep focus on terminology and not the acquiring of knowledge. We know these words, we know these places, we know these people. We know the year that this crazy stuff happened in this area and we know the customs of this land or whatever, but it's not, what do we learn though? What do those people, like, what do, because our ancestors have something to give us from our history. They have something to teach us. And so if we're walking away and we can name all the states and whatever that white people made up in Africa, that's dope or whatever. Or we can name all the ancient African civilizations. That's dope or whatever, but like, what did we learn? And how can we utilize that for now? I don't think cultural nationalists have the answer to that, and I don't think they want to find the answer to that either. And I think that we have to take very, 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 very seriously, because cultural nationalism is something that is happening in the world right now, and it is destroying people. I'm done. All right. <laughs>